Hi everyone, Professor King here. In this video, I'm going to be discussing this week's literary terms. Uh, we only have three of them. I know on the syllabus it says four because uh, one of them is imagery, which we actually already went over in a previous week. Um, but for this English 102 course for week four, we're going to be discussing uh, metaphor, alliteration, and synecdoche. Uh, and we're going to be looking for those in, in the poems uh, that we will be discussing for our discussion board. I'll also have brief discussions of those poems in a follow up video. Um, so this one should be relatively short because it's just going to discuss the literary terms that we can apply themselves. As always, uh, take notes as you go. Make sure you're pausing where you need to pause um, so that you can uh, really absorb the information and follow up. And if any questions arise, please feel free to email pronto Zoom or Instagram me at your earliest convenience. And I'm happy to help clarify anything that needs to be clarified. All right, so I'm gonna take it to the share screen now and we are going to go uh, to our PowerPoint. Um, and I'll start where we were last week, the last slide from last week was simile. Um, and as we recall, a simile compares two or more things, concepts, ideas, characters, settings, et cetera, et cetera. And it uses the words like or as. And generally in conjunction with like or as, uh, especially with as, because there's really two ases, there would be um, an adjective in the middle. An adjective, again, is a part of speech that describes something that provides description. So when we're talking about comparison, right, we're then using something, we're, we're then using description to, to create the comparison. So we generally have the simile word like or as, um, and it's conjoined at, you know, in some form with typically an adjective. And then um, it ends with some sort of noun usually to show what that thing is being compared to or described in conjunction with, okay? So if you look at the examples from last week, right? We had as fresh as a daisy, fresh being the adjective, comparing it to the noun daisy, right? As mad as hell, mad being the adjective, comparing it to the noun hell. As ugly as sin, again, adjective, ugly, sin, noun. And so when we think about comparison, particularly in the poetic sense, the reason why this is so helpful, if you recall, is that poetry is one, an, an exercise in abstract wording, right? It's not like a short story or even a recipe where there's more concrete detail. Uh, I mean, there's concrete detail, but it's not used in a sort of typical uh, prose way that 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 follows a sort of uh you know language structure poetry follows a more creative abstract structure of language where um the goal is a dominant impression right it's not always necessarily a narrative in the way a short story or say a, a play would be it's more to create a dominant impression to create an overall feeling yes some poems do have narratives like ballads for example but they require much more concise language and they require mu much more abstract language. And so similes help uh, in that feat, right? And to sort of be that concise but abstract uh, way of describing something. And very similar to simile, uh, which is the first item we'll be discussing this week is metaphor. Now metaphor is very similar to simile, right? Um, the only difference being that you do not use the words like or as when you are utilizing a metaphor. You're still comparing um, or even showing the dissimilarity between two or more items, characters, settings, etc. But you're not using the words like or as. And now I want you to think about why that might be. Okay. Um, why, what would be the difference in terms of effect on the audience, on the reader, in why a writer would choose to use a simile versus, I'm sorry, to use the word like or as versus not to use it, okay? 
So the example we see here, right, with this like amoeba dinosaur Elvis is you ain't nothing but a hound dog crying all the time, right? There's no like, there's no as, it's just you are a hound dog. There's a double negative. So we take that out, right? Ain't nothing, take out both of those. You are a hound dog. How is that different than saying you are like a hound dog? Or maybe you are as insignificant as a hound dog. Think on your own as to what the difference in your interpretation would be and why one, one writer might, or singer or songwriter might use, you know, a simile over a metaphor or vice versa. So metaphor, as this uh, info, infographic points out, it's poetically calling things something else, but again, without using like or as. And if we're talking about that direct language, that concise language, that abstract language, this hits all those points. It allows for us to, to use creative language uh, in a direct and concise way. All right, so next one is alliteration. Um, and alliteration is the phonetic repetition of consonant sounds at the beginning of words placed in a sequence, okay? Um, and that may not make a lot of sense. So I'll provide you with an example that I actually um, learned in fourth grade. When I was in fourth grade, we used to have to memorize poems. And so one week we did tongue twisters and the tongue twister I chose was this one to, to the right here, which is called Betty Botter. Some of you may have heard this before. Some of you might not be familiar with it, but I want you to, and if you look at it, right, it's got the structure of a poem. It's relatively short. Um, it has some uh, rhythm and rhyme scheme to it. Um, it definitely, uh, you know, provides a sort of overall succinct impression. So it's poetic. It's not necessarily the kind of poetry that we're covering in this class, but it does have those poetic elements to it. And so it's a great example of alliteration in, in poetry. Now, alliteration can definitely be used in types of writing other than poetry, right? There are people who use it in speeches, in short stories, in uh, songs, you know, whatever. But it's helpful for poetry because it does create that rhythm. And we'll talk about that rhythm more in just a moment. But I want to read the poem for you so that you can understand what alliteration does and what it what effect it has, again, in terms of the rhythm and the tone and the sound, et cetera. So this is Betty Botter. Betty Botter bought some butter, but she said the butter's bitter. If I put it in my batter, it will make my batter bitter. But a bitter, better butter, that would make my batter better. So she bought a bit of butter better than her bitter butter and she put it in her batter and the batter was not bitter. So it was better. Betty Botter bought a bit of better butter. The alliteration clearly is with what letter? B, right? And that B is a consonant, right? It's not a vowel. It's not A, E, I, O, U, or Y when Y is used in vowel form. Um, it has a harder sound, right? It's B actually is what's known in linguistics as a bilabial, meaning you're, you're using both your lips to, to make that sound. Um, so it's a consonant sound. It's at the beginning of the word. So that's a perfect example of alliteration. Betty Botter, right? Butter's bitter. Um, but there are other elements going on within these words. See, this seems like a very simple sort of child's tongue twister, but there's actually a lot going on here, which is really fascinating. Again, if we think about uh, things like rhythm and tone, uh, and imagery and things like that, and how, how, how these literary terms work with one another to create the overall impression. So we also have assonance, right? And what assonance is, is um, it's, it's almost the exact same thing as alliteration, but instead of using consonants like B or S um, or P, right? we're using vowels. So if Betty Botter were changed to like uh, aqua amber and we, we used a bunch of words that began with A, because A is a vowel, that would be an example of assonance, okay? Um, some people will conflate these and they will just call everything alliteration, um, but there is traditionally a difference between alliteration and assonance. Um, and then you have consonants and really 
all of alliteration and assonance and what's called internal rhyme and slant rhyme, they all fall under this umbrella of consonants, but consonants today um, is, is similar with similar to alliteration, but instead of being at the beginning of the word that, that, that uh, you know, the, the phonetic sound being at the beginning of the word, it's within words. So do you see how like Betty Botter, right? The B sound would be alliteration, but the, the T sounds, the ones that are in the middle of the word, those would be an example of, of consonants or what's known as internal alliteration. Um, and so that's why this, this tongue twister is so helpful because it's got alliteration and consonants, right? And there's even another one um, that's a form of alliteration. It's a, it's a subset of alliteration called sibilance. Some of you, some people, when they get on a microphone, they jokingly go, you know, testing one, two, three, sibilance, because they want to make sure they don't sound too too essy <laughs> for lack of too sibilant for lack of a better term like a snake sound or a whistle those have sibilance and what sibilance is is alliteration with specifically the s sound uh being repeated so um again if you think about the way that the words are spoken when we read them in our heads or we read them out loud and what effect that has it clearly has an effect on the rhythm. It clearly has an effect on the tone, right? Typically alliteration, one, it's used because it helps people to remember, right? That's one of the reasons why I can say this so quickly because it's these repetitive sounds that are easy for me to remember. Um, another, another thing is it generally has maybe like a comedic or a childlike or playful effect, not always, but uh, a lot of times it has that sort of effect, that repetitive uh, sort of feeling to it. So it helps with rhythm, it helps with memorization, it helps with tone, uh, mood, right? All of those things. And it even again helps with, with imagery because you can start to like quickly see these things occurring uh, as, they're, as they're being said. All right, so let's go on to synecdoche. No, not Schenectady, not a city in New York, but Synecdoche, 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 right? Um, Synecdoche occurs when a part of an item or a system is written or said uh, as a way of describing the entire item or system. Um, so a part represents the whole, in other words. So for example, I have so many mouths to feed. When you say that, what you're really talking about is not just the mouth, right? But the child that the mouth is attached to. The synecdoche then is saying, I have the mouths to feed, right? Because we know what that means, but it's, again, it's a more concise, a more abstract, a more poetic way of saying it. Because then you think about the actual mouth that needs to get feed, fed, and you, you know, you kind of envision the child attached to it. So other examples would be things like a head count. Oops, a head count, right? Um, a new set of wheels, you know, a head count meaning like, again, people, the things, the, the, the whole system that the individual item, the head is attached to. A new set of wheels, right? Wheels being the car that the actual individual wheels are attached to all hands on deck, right? Meaning like people will come to the deck and help out do work. So, um, you know, it's, it's again, it's a way of, of abstracting literal meaning into more poetic forms. Um, so that's it for the literary terms. I hope I'm gonna take it off share screen now. Um, but as you are thinking about these and add, as you're adding them to your list of notes of all the literary terms we're learning, I want you to uh, think about where, you know, cause we have a lot of poems this week. They're not, none of them are very long poems but we do have a lot of them. I want you to start kind of playing scavenger hunt when you're looking at these poems. So you should be reading the poems for meaning, right? And for interpretation, but you should also see how these liter literary elements are working on their own and together to affect your interpretation of these readings of these poems because 
again, when we think about writers, writers make deliberate decisions. No one is, you know, William Butler Yeats isn't sitting down <laughs> at his desk and going, you know, and just like writing willy nilly. He's drafting, he's, he's, he's thinking about all of these things from a poetic standpoint so that he can, he, his poem will have a certain effect on you. All of these poets, right? Neruda and Stevie Smith and uh, Gene Toomer and all these people, they're all doing that. So don't just think about like the plot, right? Or what the poem is saying, think about what it is doing, how it is functioning, because that is equally as important in how you are receiving the poem, right? Um, so that's it. Again, if you have questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to contact me, email, canvas, pronto, Instagram, Zoom, however you want to hit me up. I'm around. Um, but I hope you have a wonderful night and rest of your weekend, and I will see you in cyberspace. <laughs>